Hello, friends. It is so, so good to be back. Uh, I know I hadn't posted a video on YouTube in a while, but uh, some personal news. I recently got married last month, um, actually exactly a month ago almost, but I am back and very, very excited to discuss literature and lots of interesting deep ideas with you. In this video, I wanted to initially mark the end of my reading season with uh, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. But I just couldn't decisively culminate all my thoughts into one just yet. Instead, I want to explore in this video the idea of naming one another and how that might relate to marriage and how we view ourselves, one's identity. It's really fascinating for me to learn how we name one another and in so doing, what we think of them and even ourselves. Take, for example, the way Rochester refers to Bertha, his actual legal wife, whom he has cast aside and kept hidden for all these years. Um, it's always with the intent to distance himself from the fate that befell him. In his eyes, a very cruel and harsh fate. He was lied to and cheated into marriage uh, to a woman that he does not love. She does not love him in return. And as he explains in chapter uh, 26, to him, she is the bad, mad, and embruted partner. Embruted is defined as beastly and very base. This is Charlotte Bronte's literary hint and nod to John Milton's Paradise Lost, in which we have a devil serpent-like analogy that culminates in the question, but what will not ambition and revenge descend to? Rochester sees himself as this tragic, Byronic uh, character who, albeit flawed and um, brooding and very moody, has in a sense also fallen victim to this beastly fate that Bertha symbolizes for him. In his own eyes, he is victimized by the wife he so distantly and impersonally refers to as that woman. The wife, never calling her by her name, Mrs. Rochester, who he on many occasions refers to as having sullied his own name as uh, having been called by society and law a part of him. And if we could pause for a moment, calling Bertha Mason not by her name, but by reference to her as that woman, it creates such an impersonal and, um, and distanced way of thinking about someone, right? They're no longer in any way identified by their individuality, but instead are cast off as the other. Someone I was listening to recently drew a parallel between Rochester's That Woman reference and, and more recently in real life when Bill Clinton referred to Monica Lewinsky as that woman when he publicly stated that he did not have sexual relations with that woman. So these are two simple words that in context could have such a powerful message and a message of dominance over one's own identity that uh, that Charlotte Bronte certainly understood and made reference to by way of Rochester and his relationship or lack thereof between him and Bertha Mason. And throughout the book, there are so many ripe examples of how his behavior toward Bertha Mer Mason is highly contrasted with the eagerness and enthusiasm with which he wants to very quickly, instantaneously make Jane Eyre into Mrs. Rochester and make her his. It's also interesting to see how poised Jane remains throughout all of it, um, how she does not lose her footing in her decision to keep her own personhood intact. To her, marriage is the union between two individual beings. One is not subsumed by the other, either nominally or practically speaking. So. When I was reading this, certain personal events occurred for me by way of marriage this autumn. Um, perhaps because of the context of my own personal events, I was very struck by the way that Charlotte Bronte decided to go about in uh, naming when it came to marriage and that transition, the idea that upon marriage a woman is to relinquish her maiden name and instead assume her husband's last name and with it a new identity. And it's so funny to me that in this department I found a comrade from 1847 uh, in the form of Charlotte Bronte. One of the most frequent questions I was asked when I was getting married last month was whether I would be changing my my last name. This was never asked by my now husband, it was always asked by others. And upon letting them know that I would be keeping my last name, it was always interesting to me to see their reaction because it tended to verge on a bit of confusion. And on more than one occasion, I was struck with the response, well, 
that's that's just something that people do. Why aren't you doing it? I think it was just so difficult for me to explain why just innately something didn't sit well with me in my um uh, in in this attempt to change my own last name. And I attach so much significance and uh I guess identity to my own name that to me it seemed a little absurd to be as I said, relinquishing that. But it was also difficult for me to explain all of that um, and not sound odd. So my go-to response would always be, oh, you know, just I don't, I don't want to go ahead and take care of all the paperwork that comes with a last name change. And there's just so much bureaucratic back and forth with legal documents and so on. I just, out of, out of laziness, I don't want to approach that. But that simply wasn't true. In reality, I think Charlotte Bronte, through this book, just perfectly captured uh, the sentiment that I personally feel toward last names and marriage. Bronte took great effort to keep Jane Eyre afloat as an independent personhood who is not subsumed by Mr. Rochester's keen attempts to label her as Mrs. Rochester. We could extend that idea to perhaps even not a potential husband's keen enthusiasm toward a last name change, um, but society's just broadly speaking. It's, as you know, one of the many responses that I personally got, it's just something people often do, so why not do it? Um, to me, that wasn't enough of a reason. And I found it very serendipitous to have read Jane Eyre during this time, because Charlotte Bronte addresses all of this, and in some parts subtly, in some parts very uh, overtly. For example, there's a scene in chapter 25 where uh, Rochester attempts to label Jane Eyre's suitcases, his soon-to-be wife's suitcases, and he's very, very eager to himself take care of this task and label the suitcases Mrs. Rochester. And Jane Eyre has a moment where she, uh, she notes, I, at least, had nothing more to do. Notice the I in the individual and the personal. There were my trunks, packed, locked, corded, ranged in a row along the wall of my little chamber. Tomorrow, at this time, they would be far on their road, road to London, and so should I, or rather, not I, but one Jane Rochester, a person whom as yet I knew not. The cards of address alone remained to nail on. They lay four little squares in the drawer. Mr. Rochester had himself written the direction, Mrs. Rochester, Hotel London. I could not persuade myself to affix them or to have them affixed. Mrs. Rochester. She did not exist. She would not be born till tomorrow, sometime after 8 o'clock a.m., and I would wait to be assured she had come into the world alive before I assigned to her all that property. We have so many, so much uh, symbolic nods to, you know, this idea that Mrs. Rochester is not yet born, and uh, Mr. Rochester is so keen and um, so immediate in his efforts to make sure that Jane is reborn as Mrs. Rochester. But despite his enthusiasm to have her reborn as his, Jane notices that, again, it was not I, but one Jane Rochester, and she's unfamiliar with this person. She does not digest such a proposition. Ultimately, their love, as evidenced in the last chapter of the book, succeeds only when Rochester views her in the closing chapter as simply as Jane, and when Mr. Rochester becomes, in the closing chapters, in her loving words and of her own accord, my Edward. So for someone who has never understood our collective eagerness to drop one's name and for the sake of convention take on another, I think Charlotte Bronte in 1847 hinted at an earnest way of going about this. I would say the whole maiden name, last name change that exists to this day is antiquated, but Bronte would indeed prove me wrong. I find it so, so fascinating that at that time, that period, she was thinking about these things and ever so slyly was able to express this view on marriage and uh, one's identity through through Jane Eyre. And so I'd like to think that in this way, Charlotte Bronte was very ahead of her time and that we simply just haven't caught on to her. <laughs> but with that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you did, and if you'd like to chat more, please, please, please like the video, comment below. I'd love to step into a dialogue with you. Uh, until next time, bye.